Doug, thank you for being here with us today. Uh, you have an incredible presentation. Uh, as I said, it's Janusz Brzezik-like with all due respect to our dear friend Janusz Brzezik. It is so expansive and so detailed. This is worth the price of admission. It truly is. So bravo for doing such a great job and being with us today. I've known Doug for what, 20, 20 years, Doug, something like that? Yeah, probably more than that, Delco. Back to Delco days. Oh my God, oh my God, Hilton had 20 <laughs> years ago. So I, I knew Doug when he was just kind of almost a recently minted PhD from, from Purdue. And uh, Doug's had an incredible past and uh, his, he's recently started his own consulting firm, uh, M2M Technologies, uh, specializing in MEMS and semiconductor technology, product and process commercialization and supply chain. He, uh, he's been very much involved uh, in working with a group over in China, CTO uh, of the group Hanking Electronics, which built the first 20 millimeter uh, pure MEMS wafer fab in China uh, and, uh, and has done an incredible amount of interesting things in the packaging area, especially where he worked uh, as an EVP at Integrated Sensing Systems in Ypsilanti, Michigan. Uh, with uh, with my friend Dr. Najafi, and he's uh, launched many multiple microfluidic sensor products, and uh, including an FDA-approved MEMS drug infusion device, and also has been uh, involved with a microsensor packaging company called Nano Getters, which was acquired by Materion. Uh, again, uh, uh, he's been in uh, the uh, business for many, many years. He's worked at Delphi uh, and uh, holds a PhD, as I mentioned, uh, from Purdue and has published more than 120 technical papers, 70 issued patents, and is also on the board of the Mansef organization as vice president of Asia. So thank you, Doug, for sharing your wonderful what, 30 plus years of experience in the MEMS industry? Okay, great. Thanks for the introduction, Roger. And Ira, thanks for putting on this event. I really appreciate it. Uh, Roger asked me to talk about kind of the evolution of MEMS packaging. Um, I've worked long enough that I think I've been involved with virtually every type of MEMS package there is. And I'll kind of go over those today as, a, as I move forward here. Um, MEMS package, as people have you know, talked about, I think Roger mentioned, it can be 10% of the cost, it can be 70% of the cost, and it all depends on the application, whether it's an industrial package, uh, you know, the package might, you know, this would be a 70% of the cost package that would be stainless steel or titanium and have all kinds of interfaces, all the way down to the, you know, the consumer devices in our phones that have to be extremely inexpensive, small, cheap. Uh, it can be medical, it can be implanted, it can be flex as Patricia was talking about. It can be aerospace that Nick was talking about. Some of the aerospace parts have to last, you know, inertial sensors and altimeters have to last for, you know, 20 years, theoretically, with, you know, very little shift. Uh, and then, of course, it can be in the automotive industry, which is a pretty harsh environment, but uh, they don't give you a lot of money to build an expensive package. So you've got to kind of have a low cost, very robust package in that industry. And then there's just uh, hundreds of facets to packaging a MEMS device. Again, it's, it's, it can be uh, application driven, it can be material driven, cost driven, uh, there's reliability issues, there's modeling, there's packaging and shipping, uh, you name it, it's something you gotta think about and you gotta plan for this. And again, depending on your application, depending on the cost overhead you, can, you have to work with, you gotta consider all these things up front. Uh, with all these all these parameters in mind. Now, a basic consumer device uh, is made up of three big parts, and the package is just one of them, but it also has a MEMS chip and typically an ASIC chip. Uh, and like Roger said, you know, we often stack these together and interconnect the ASIC and MEMS chip uh, inside the package, either through wire bonding or bumping. And then you've got to think of test, test and calibration, because um, sensors require uh, some sort of outside stimulation, whether it's infrared radiation, it might be uh, acoustic stimulation, or it might be motion. 
or pressure or chemical. So a lot of things to think of when you're considering the package design with respect to calibration and test. Um, you might start with a, a specification. Uh, temperature operating range is usually the first thing I look at. You could be as cold as negative 60 or negative 40 if it's automotive. And then the upper range can be anywhere from, you know, room temperature to 85 to, you know, over 400 degrees C, as, as Nick showed. Um, for uh, many sensors, you got to think of chemical exposure. Is there is it a chemical sensor or is it in an environment where it will be exposed to a chemi chemical like, like a flow sensor or pressure sensor? It's not a chemical sensor, but it's going to be in a fluid. Um, for medical devices, it may have to be biocompatible. And so you've got to think of all those issues with material uh, compatibility with your package housing. Then you think of uh, your, your mechanical issues, whether it's shock and vibration, drop testing, uh, shooting it out of an artillery shell, that's, that's a huge shock. You've got electrical issues, EMC, electrostatic discharge, power requirements. Is it going to be wireless? Is it going to be batteryless? Is it going to have energy harvesting? And then package size. So uh, in, in the industrial environment, they hate small packages. They like a big, robust package. Uh, but obviously, for an implant or for a consumer device, you want to minimize the package size as much as possible. So those are the kind of mechanical issues that the uh, engineering team has to work with when thinking of a, me a MEM sensor or actuator. And of course, a lot of uh, groups will start off with modeling. Uh, that's the preferred way to go. Ideally, you've got some prototypes that you verified your model with before you start tweaking this too extensively with your model. Certainly ANSYS and COMSOL, soft MEMS, those are all software packages that the industry uses. You got to think of your uh, thermal coefficient of expansion, your Young's modulus, your thermal conductivity. Again, those are some of the things that Nick brought up. But if you're doing fluid interactions, you think of turbulence. Uh, you might think of um, uh, water hammer events, breaking a diaphragm. So you've got uh, fracture toughness to think about. And then you have your electrical issues of EMC resistance. And those are the kind of things that can be modeled. It's not just resonant frequency and electrical resistance, but you can model all these fluidic and mechanical and thermal interactions. So I, I encourage you to take advantage of those resources if you have them. Now, fluid exposure. Early on, uh, you know, I was in the automotive industry and they were some of the first applications uh, that started seeing rapid degradation of MEM sensors. So you saw corrosion, you had to start, that's when we started using silicone coatings. Uh, if you didn't, you would get wire bond lifting. If you were exposing the pressure sensors to say the air intake uh, manifold in an automobile. Some of the companies like uh, Freescale, which is now NXP and Merit, started looking at backside sensing so that the fluid only hits the bottom side of a silicon diaphragm or for some of the flow sensors I used, you only you only hit the bottom side or an internal uh, silicon tube or micro channel. So those are ways that people have come up with using unique packages designs and unique materials uh, to limit corrosion of electrically active and corrosion corrosionable materials in your sensors. Now there's there's different levels of packaging. So we like to, ideally, you can start with wafer level packaging. That was something we kind of came up with in the uh, 90s with uh, inertial sensors. So instead of having bare dye exposed, uh, we actually had wafer to wafer bonding. We started with adhesive bonds. Uh, we then migrated to anodic and glass reflow. But we started doing wafer level package to protect uh, sensitive elements, particularly motion sensors and even optical and infrared sensors. This allows you to go down to chip scale packages. So your, your package, as the technology evolved and we had through silicon vias or through glass vias, interposers, et cetera, you can start doing chip scale packaging. So you have a tiny MEMS package or actuator. We then talk about sub packages. This could be a, a chip put into a plastic uh, cavity package like I showed earlier, or ceramic, metal, put it on panels, put it on ceramic substrates. Uh, you overmold it, you perylene coat it, a variety of coatings for protections. Then there's the system housing, uh, which may contain fluid interconnects and electrical interfaces. And then finally, don't forget shipping containers. Um, some of the first inertial products I was involved with, when we shipped them from North America to Asia, they got damaged just in shipping. They were banging around, uh, hitting each other, and fracturing uh, uh, the micromachine structure. So shipping itself, 
uh, has to be thought of when you're considering the entire holistic packaging solution. Now, one, one thing I found is that packaging evolution kind of follows uh, the MIMS product development cycle. Uh, and this is an example. In this example, I'm looking at gyroscopes and accelerometers. So like for a typical vacuum package gyroscope or oscillator, you might start in a lab with a vacuum you know, chamber. You get some good cues and resonant frequency data. Uh, then you might use a, a welded TO can, put your part in there, do some characterization on the bench, or you might use solder reflow in a ceramic package. So those are the kind of intermediate stages to gather more prototype or development sample data. The ultimate goal is going into maybe a plastic package like this LGA uh, surface mount mountable package shown uh, kind of towards the right, and then eventually into a chip scale package. So vacuum, I, you know, I find it, it's kind of an interesting transition where how we develop a package has kind of mimicked this evolution, this multi-decade evolution for packaging for MEM sensors. And then, so just to start off with this evolutionary approach, the first product I'll talk about are metal TO cans. This, these were developed in the 50s for discrete transistors. And it was the easiest off-the-shelf package that people could grab and put a pressure sensor in. You know, Roger mentioned Bell Labs working on pressure sensors in the mid-50s. Uh, you know, and Joe Giacchino, I remember he worked on them in the, you know, the 60s for the oil industry. And you would just grab off the shelf TO cans and put the chips in there. And we still do that. You, there's still gas sensors. There's still infrared sensors um, that are using this. There's still pressure sensors with unique ports for differential pressure. Um, people are using these types of sensors for, they put unique um, uh, uh I guess you call it light filters or infrared filters or lenses in the top of the TO can and then weld attach this. And you simply wire bond to these metal posts. The, the metal posts go through a reflowed glass uh, dielectric through that package and that's soldered to a circuit board. And then in the industrial um, market, they kind of ran with this idea, but instead of having a, a Kovar, a Kovar uh, TO can, they actually made these things out of stainless steel. And so they'd make their own customized stainless steel Kovar cans, put a pressure sensor in there, fill that full of oil with a, with a corrugated steel diaphragm. Uh, and that way the, the corrosive environment would be bending that flexible stainless or titanium corrugated diaphragm, transmitting the pressure through the silicone uh, and then bending the silicon diaphragm. So you, you took the problem of corrosion of the MEMS chip out of the equation but you had to do that at extremely expensive cost because these are relatively low volume, you know, thousands to tens of thousands per year, uh, really expensive materials. But the end, end product is probably three to five thousand dollars, so it can absorb that. And there's our, there are issues in packaging here. If you get a bubble in that silicone oil, you're going to get all kinds of errors. So there's all kinds of tricks in packaging to degas the oil and properly package this for uh, the the extremely tight specification uh, environment used for uh, industrial sensing. Um, another approach to industrial sensing that was uh, pioneered in Japan at Nagano Kaiki is putting on um, strain gauges onto stainless steel diaphragms. And again, this is the approach of the sensor is on one side of the device, the fluids on the opposite side of the device um, so that the circuits are never touched. And in the 1990s, NKS built their own uh, special clean room where they just processed polished stainless steel uh, pressure sensor elements. So each wafer, which is really a stainless steel chip, is, is a single sensor and they process them in trays. I had the pleasure of working with them on a technology transfer project for three years, you know, duplicating that process and uh, really learning a lot about this unique uh, approach to sensors. And then this was kind of replicated by other companies like MSI and Sensata, where they would take a sandblasted stainless diaphragm and then use frit reflow glass to attach a single crystal silicon strain gauge to get higher, uh, higher sensitivities. So that's another approach to uh, packaging in industrial and then automotive applications. And then you look at um, the ceramic uh, surdip. This was again, 
developed for discretes and ICs in the 1960s and rapidly adopted uh, by uh, the MIMS organizations, uh, inertial sensors, pressure sensors, and it's an easy way to get a chip and wire bind it in your lab and start testing parts. And uh, one thing that was rapidly adapted, though, for particularly industrial and aerospace and military applications was using this for resonating gyros. You could package these in very reliable, very hermetic parts. Uh, the lids are placed on this graphite heater. You then, you know, you flip the uh, ceramic package, which has the wire bonded chip upside down. Uh, you refill the solder in vacuum, uh, and then you've got a hermetically sealed part. So again, a tried and true IC package technique applied to MEM sensors. Well, in the late 70s, early, not, early, early 80s, the automotive industry had to adapt MEMS technology for EPA requirements and for safety requirements, um, mass airflow measurements to, to reduce pollution in the engines and airbag modules. So ceramic and metal were too expensive. They had to come up with some plastic uh, packages. And so they, they adopted um, injection molded lead frame packages. And these are some examples of some of the more robust automotive sensors. And like Roger said, these were kind of the early chiplets. We actually were stacking chips onto ceramic substrates and onto each other chips on chips uh, for some of these airbag accelerometer modules back in the uh, uh, late 80s and early 90s. And then some of this technology, like uh, some of the pressure sensors, were adopted for occupant detection, where silicone oil bladders that you would actually sit on will deflect the diaphragm and, and, and let, the, uh, let the car know that there's someone sitting there and don't fire the airbag uh, if there's not, and fire the airbag if the person is heavy enough. Uh, so just a variety of new plastic-based packages for the automotive industry that dominated high-volume MIMS until uh, the mid to late 90s. Now, medical devices, that's another interesting application with a whole unique set of requirements. Uh, the blood pressure cuff sensor was an easy spin off of the automotive sensor and uh, Motorola uh, was, you know, jumped right on that. That was back in the uh, 80s uh, with their uh, plastic pressure sensors. But other groups have taken MEM sensors and actually use them in implants, use them for drug infusion. Uh, and uh, it, when you do that, you have to get FDA approval. So if you think of a, a device like a blood pressure you know, sensor that's external, that'd be a class two device. It's still kind of difficult, it may take six months to a year to get FDA approval. If it's an implant, it's class three, you've got to think of biocompatibility, uh, red, belt, red blood cell lysis, you've got to think of leaching. And so that's a really tough nut to crack and it takes millions of dollars and many years to get approval for a MEMS device to function. So you're thinking of not only cell coating, uh, blood is basically salt water with white blood cells. It's worse than salt water. It's very corrosive. It'll dissolve gold. Uh, and you've got to sterilize things. So can your device take gamma ray sterilization or autoclave? Uh, so those are the kind of things to think about because, you know, gamma ray is going to erase your memory if you've got an ASIC. So there's a lot of different packaging, uh, packaging issues you've got to consider in the medical arena. Okay, consumer, that's where, you know, right now we're, the consumer dominates the market. It's, you know, over 90% of all MEMS chips and devices are for consumer, for smartphones, for wearables, for toys, for gaming, et cetera. Uh, the goal for consumer devices is uh, low cost, small, thin, low power. So those are challenges, system level challenges on their own. Uh, and they're, they're a pretty decent packaging challenge because small, thin, low cost is tough to do if you don't want your sensor to drift. You know, a sensor, a MEM sensor is often, uh, you know, some people used to talk in automotive, we used to say that the uh, pressure sensor is really just a strain sensor of how bad your package is made, because it's going to vary like crazy over temperature and thermal shock. You know, you've got you've to formulate the right adhesives and coatings, et cetera. So this was a challenge in consumer applications to make it cheap, and make a nice stable sensor. So let's talk uh, cost breakdown. And we used to have a rule of thumb that your MEMS package was a third of the cost. The MEMS chip was a third, the ASIC was a third. Of course, this varies with application, particularly for package. 
uh, you, know, you know, like Roger said, it could be 10, it could be 70%. This is a, um, a high volume consumer inertial, inertial device. It's a pie chart for the cost breakdown. It's done by System Plus Consulting. Um, only 13% of this cost was actually package related. Uh, it wasn't 33%. You see the ACID, CMOS ASIC was uh, by far the most expensive component followed by the MEMS chip. So that's an example of a cost breakdown. Um, and like I said, the package cost can vary widely depending on uh, application. Now, where does most of this consumer packaging take place? And, and the answer is in Asia. So, um, you know, probably in the 70s, I see uh, 60s and 70s, I see packaging started moving, migrating to Japan and Korea, Taiwan. Uh, that's continued uh, and accelerated. And the same has happened to MIMS. So MIMS, you, when you think of MIMS packaging in high volume, you think of ASC and Amcor, for example, uh, high volume, low cost plastic packaging. Uh, one thing with testing, and I show this in the bottom left hand corner, this is a SPIA tester for inertial sensors. You've got to, you've got to have test systems that actually move the part. They rotate it, they shake it, they twist it. Uh, those are the kind of things you have to think of when you're thinking of OSATs. Okay, now on to wafer level packaging. Uh, wafer to wafer bonding, it's something I've worked at, worked with for years. Uh, typically, you have a capping wafer, capping your MEMS or your micro machine device. You're going to have a seal ring. And again, this seal ring can be metal, it can be solder or eutectic, it can be glass, it can be an adhesive. Uh, you can do silicon direct bonding, you can do anodic silicon glass bonding. You got to have cross unders if you're going to use wire bonding. Uh, so think of that, you've got to get under that seal ring and keep the seal ring hermetic. If it's a vacuum device, uh, you've got to think of how am I bonding this thing in vacuum? Uh, how is the surfaces of the wafers treated so they don't outgas and, and ruin the vacuum quality? You may incorporate a thin film getter to help improve vacuum packaging. So, so those are some of the wafer level and chip level uh, design and process items you've got to contemplate when you're looking at packaging. And then again, in addition to operating temperature, let's think of wafer level packaging temperature range. These are the typical on the left are the typical types of bonding technologies that are used and then the temperature scale. So if you're gonna do uh, silicon to silicon fusion bonding with annealing, you know, MIT did this multi-wafer turbine you know, stack at one time where they were direct bonding silicon and then annealing them to get the actual you know, atomic atomic diffusion across the bond interface, that's going to be done at maybe 1,000 to 1,100 degrees C. Uh, you back that back down, glass reflow is probably 400 to 425 C. Uh, eutectic germanium aluminum is the same range. As you look at different alloys, eutectics, you may get down to 300. Uh, you can even get down with, uh, you know, with tin and indium alloys down under 200. Uh, but then you're kind of worrying about, you know, if you get the alloy bonding temperature low enough, you won't be able to do solder reflow at the board level. So you've got to think of these issues as well when you're lowering your bond temperatures. And of course, there are things like silicon direct plasma activation bond, which is essentially room temperature. Maybe you'll do an anneal at 150. And then you can do SU8 and other adhesive bonding for extremely low temperature devices, say infrared devices that may have some low temperature film on the, on the exterior of the lens. So Again, the application and the material set will, de will determine what wafer level packaging strategy and process you'll use. Um, one way, as I mentioned, one way to improve your vacuum packaging is through a thin film getter. Uh, Roger mentioned Nano Getter is the company I founded. That's where you use a thin film uh, active reactive metal inside the cavity. It can be inside uh, the top cap of the wafer. You can e we even put some thin film getters on the a non-moving inactive MEMS device area. And these, these reactive getters, um, metals are kind of like a sponge. They will chemically trap oxygen, hydrogen, uh, O2, nitrogen, and uh, carbon, carbon oxide uh, compounds. So it's actually absorbing these materials and these gases come off the surfaces, even though your bonder might be bonding uh, at a, you know, they may be bonding at a pressure of like a less than a millitor, um, without a getter, the desorption of these gases from the surfaces will result in a pressure of around one or two torr. So think of degassing and using uh, uh, integrated getters to uh, improve that. 
And this can also be used on ceramic and metal packages. Uh, again, this is more commonly used in your aerospace, um, aerospace uh, applications or infrared sensor applications. Uh, and they've selectively been deposited on germanium lids and windows, sapphire, kovar, stainless, et cetera. Now, one interesting thing we found several years ago when we were dealing with gas MEM sensors was that um, almost every wafer to wafer bonding technique we used, and it, even um, CVD seal techniques we used, uh, was permeable to helium. So it, we, would, we did a variety of different gas studies. Hydrogen wasn't permeable, permeable to these types of bonding issues. Uh, air, et cetera, would not be. But if you did like a typical helium bomb test, we found Q resonator, resonator Qs going down over time, and this could even be a delayed effect. So when looking at applications that are used in a helium containing gas, uh, we found that we had to, you know, you had to use TO cans, soldered ceramic parts, uh, and there was a couple of, uh, couple of tricks and a couple of seal materials you could do to get a her helium hermetic wafer to wafer bond um, device. And this kind of popped up recently with iPhones. People were working around MRI machines, which has a lot of helium, uh, and their iPhones were dying. And it was because of a uh, ingress of helium into the vacuum sealed resonators. And then, you know, in the future, I see MIMS packaging is, is continuing on. So MIMS wafer level packaging is already being adopted on quantum devices. So you're seeing a number of uh, groups in North America uh, using glass to glass bonding, glass to silicon bonding, thin film getters, coatings, et cetera, uh, on the next generation quantum devices. So things that we you know, developed in the 80s or 90s, uh, it's being modified and used for atomic clocks and for uh, quantum computers. So it just keeps going on and it just keeps being adapted and modified and tweaked a little bit. Uh, for the next generation of technology. And then 3D printing, that's an area, uh, of course, that's seeing uh, a lot of use and a lot of use in packaging. And I'll be talking, uh, Roger Sensors Converge in June on 3D printed MEMS and 3D printed uh, MEMS packages. But uh, in actuality, we started using 3D printing in the late 90s in uh, automotive MEMS. We, we would do solid model devices and we had these really waxy, clunky, plastic 3D printed parts we'd take to conference rooms and show around and say, hey, this is the next generation of package. Uh, in the mid, early to mid 20, 2000s, uh, we started actually using 3D printed cavity fluidic packages, which is shown in the middle. This is a drug delivery device. Uh, we not only used a 3D printed lure fitted micro, or 3D printed cavity package for our MEMS chip, uh, we also got rid of the ASIC and did a printed circuit board drop-in with an FPGA. So we were trying to go really fast through a development cycle. We got rid of the ASIC. We got rid of injection molding and long lead times on molds. And we just 3D printed our prototyping package. And now you're seeing uh, this being applied to microfluidics. You're seeing people able to do hot pressed insert metal inserts into 3D printed pl plastic packages, which is kind of cool for automotive industry because you typically have to have a a bolt, uh, you know, you're using bolts and you, you'll just really screw up a plastic package. So you have to have a metal insert. <clears throat> and then the bottom left are some 3D printed plastic and uh, I think titanium microfluidic chips where we're designed in the tubing interface on the side of the chip uh, at the wafer level. And you can print the whole, you can print the resonator, you can print the, the chip and you can print the initial fluid interface that you can weld right to. So 3D printing is going to, really increase the capabilities of how we do sensors, how we do actuators in the MEMS community in the future. So concluding remarks are just um, uh, MEMS sensor packaging is really diverse. It depends on the application for both um, materials that you are using and fluids that you're sensing. It's evolved over four decades. Uh, there's a lot of new packaging methods that are being developed to keep shrinking the MEMS products. Um, and again, the, the packaging design will depend on not only science, materials, costs, form factors, and what you have to do to calibrate it, to fit it all together into the application. Thanks. Thank you very much, Doug, uh, for uh, compressing 45 plus years of MEMS packaging 
with a most informative 30 minute presentation. This is the quintessential distillation of information. And thank you for sharing that with us. Uh, I think there's lots of really incredible takeaways and lessons learned in what you've uh, provided. Uh, and uh, uh, we're looking forward to seeing some interesting questions being posed by the audience. I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask a question. Uh, while you did very briefly talk about testing, Doug, I was interested more, and especially since you worked at, uh, at um, Delco, can you tell us a little bit more about what level of testing went on with the MEMS, I, I guess, pressure sensors and accelerometers? You did pressure sensors and accelerometers at Delco? Yeah, yeah, you would do wafer level tests, you know, in process electrical, you do wafer level testing um, just to look at uh, the obvious failure modes. And then after dicing and packaging, uh, you do a package level test and package calibration. And you generally, when you had a first product, you would do three temperature testing. So you do cold, room, and hot. Uh, then as you got more uh, confident in your product, you would drop out maybe hot, drop out cold, uh, and eventually just do room temperature testing and calibration for those sensors. Now, the other question is, uh, it's one thing to test pressure sensors, but what about accelerometers? That, to me, seems like a pretty daunting task of having to put them on a spin table and, and test them. Uh, was this, uh, could you tell us a little bit about testing accelerometers and inertial sensors? Yeah, you don't, you don't typically use a centrifuge and, and other, other than product development. So um, what you will do is... Um, for most like high high volume 1G accelerometers, you basically just kind of have a table that flips them. And since they're 1G sensitive, it's really easy to check for, you know, you'll flip them in all three axis if it's a three axis accelerometer, for example. Uh, you'll And during this flipping operation, you're rotating so you can test gyros at the same time. So that's typically, you do that uh, with a large panel with, you know, maybe a hundred devices at one time. I see, great. Okay, let's see, we've got a question here. Let's see what the question is. Um, question is, are there many MEM sensor types using the benefit of wafer-to-wafer -wafer bonding for final packaging? Yeah, yeah, that's typically not, there, have, there aren't a lot in high volume that are basically just doing MEMS wafer-to-wafer -wafer bonding and then package them, you know, like a, with a flip chip. You tip, Since you have to use an ASIC, you would have to, you know, think of TDK Invensense, where they'll actually bond the ASIC to the MEMS device. Uh, if they had through silicon vias, then you potentially could do that. Now, right now, they don't do that, but, you know, ST Micro has looked at using uh, through silicon vias and taking that approach. Uh, but that I'm aware of, nobody's doing that without a plastic interface or a or PCB panel uh, in between the solder bumps and the silicon. Yeah. As I mentioned earlier in my presentation, I talked to Chip Spengler, who you certainly know, and he told me that back way back when they were developing that uh, Isaac uh, accelerometer, they were using mm -hmm. through silicon vias. And I kind of brought that out because he was very proud of that when I interviewed him a couple oh, of yeah. weeks ago. So that oh. was kind of very, very early on. And I even think it was, to use his word, foreshadowing what went on in the semiconductor industry. Actually, Motorola and Ford developed the first through silicon via bump for pressure sensors in the 80s, early 80s. Right. So they actually had developed through silicon vias with a reflowed solder seal that they could bump to a printed circuit board. I want to also thank Adventest, uh, who's received the highest uh, customer satisfaction surveys, ranking as the number one large supplier of semiconductor equipment in 2022 from Tech, Tech Insights. Also would like to thank Omcor and Cadence. Uh, collectively, their sponsorship has enabled us to produce this event and uh, make it available to everybody free. So I want to thank them once again. And when you have an opportunity, please to thank them. And lastly, I would like to thank everyone here for participating. Uh, we will have the slides up next week. YouTube videos, the first two days are up. The remaining ones will be up uh, by next week. So I want to thank everybody and wish you a good rest of your day and look forward to seeing you at a future MEPTEC event. Thank you.